which have the very high altitudes. And the reason we've never been to the higher altitudes before is because of the balloon landing. So these are compatible with other landing techniques. But the balloon landings that we use with Spirit and Opportunity depend upon enough um, atmosphere, okay, to uh, slow the ball, the balloons, the beach balls, so to speak, down enough so that when they land on the surface, they won't destroy the robots inside them. Spirit and Opportunity. Well, the problem is th those means that means you want to land at very low altitudes. The very low altitudes are the vast seas that we see in pictures of Mars. Deserts. They don't look very interesting. The place that's very interesting is the much higher altitudes up near Mount Olymp Olympus and other things. So the problem is with the current rover technology, you really can't go to the, to the high altitudes. So it's sort of like the man who drops his watch on the street and he's looking under the lamp post and a guy comes along and says, can I help you? He says, yeah, I lost my watch. And he looks around on the lamppost and he says, I didn't, I don't see your watch. You sure you dropped it here by the lamppost? He says, no, I didn't. He said, I actually dropped it up the street where it's really dark. He says, well, why are you looking here? He said, that's where the light is. So we're looking at, in the deserts of Mars for signs of life, but we really should be looking at the higher elevations. These balls can, can, can go to the higher elevations because they're so robust in terms of being almost all plastic. Now the question was asked, what about, um, um, are there caves on Mars? Well, here you can see picture of surface picture of the caves on Mars. This is taken from an orbiter. And in fact, that's what's called a lava tube. Now, hmm. what happens is, when you have a volcano, any planet with a, volca a volcanic history, that vo the lava flows down the sides of the of the volcanoes and out along the surface in rivers. The first part to freeze is the surface. And what happens is the lava keeps flowing and it leaves behind it an empty tube called a lava tube. They're everywhere. They can be seen on, on the moon, they can be seen on Venus, and they can even be seen on Io, or Io, depending on how you pronounce it. So lava tubes are <coughs> are ubiquitous <coughs> throughout the universe, uh, universe. They're also found quite easily found everywhere in the, in, on Earth. So this is the Habashi Cave in Saudi Arabia. You can see this is very nice. The, the, the tube-like structure, that's the surface. I should go back. What happens is you see these dents. Those dents are where the, the roof of the lava tube has collapsed. They're called skylights. So they would provide entrance into the lava tubes, and you can see there's a section here which you really would like to explore. And this distance from here to there is about 300 miles. So that's several, you know, maybe a quarter of a mile of uncollapsed. That's plenty of room to go in there um, and provide it. There are other places where there are much longer sections. So this is what it looks like. This is what the Habashi Cave looks at at night. Um, to, with candles in there to give you a better section, a sense of what the cross section looks like. So there are caves everywhere. Um, there are other challenging topologies that you'd like to do. This is a picture of, from Mars. This, you know, that's a ridge that's up there, um, and we haven't been to any places like that. Do these look like dried riverbeds mm -hmm. going down to a lake down there? So you can imagine you couldn't push a rover off the cliff and, and the mission planners just wouldn't let you do that. It's bye-bye rover, you know. Um, and you, they cost, they're pretty expensive and the delivery costs are huge. So, um, and you can't climb up from the lower uh, levels. But you could certainly drop these balls down there and lose a few hundred to explore that. I'd love to get down there and see if that really was um, a dry uh, lake. So you could launch a thousand of these remotes with the same launch volume and weight as Spirit. Everybody knows Spirit is still up there, 600, 700, 900 days wandering around. I don't think it's producing a lot of new scientific activity because it has difficulty getting to new places. But, you know, it, it does what it does on that spot. So it's maybe roamed in, maybe in a few kilometers. It hasn't gone very far. Um, 
So it's still looking around as opportunity is, but it's a great scientific and engineering adventure. So, but for the same mass weight and volume, which is what where the cost is, you know, the delivery cost, like I can say, you can send over a thousand of these balls to Mars. Okay, you could deploy it by an orbiter with an airbag landing, like you saw in the. You could deploy it by balloon, <laughs> balloons and airy vehicles. You could have astronauts out there with a, with 20 of these in their backpack. They could walk up to a cave and drop it in, drop them in. Or you could have an autonomous rover, have them in the back seat, you know, or in the trunk, and it would lay its eggs in an appropriate place. <laughs> what? Pods. In fact, the Chinese have picked up on this, and they'd like to do that, and they're studying it. But anyway, so what does the system look like? Okay. So it's a plastic ball. It's powered by polymer muscles, meaning it's powered all by plastic actuators. Um, it can hop in different directions because it has the ability to tip the way it goes. Uh, Hyper-efficient fuel cells, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Many sensors, micro-scale imagers, environmental sound sensors, and communications by means of a local area networks and co uh, collective group behaviors, uh, probably under supervisor central control from an orbit. Okay, so in here, so it's powered by <laughs> hydrogen and oxygen. You combine hydrogen and oxygen in the fuel cell to produce electricity that causes the polymer actuators to activate the ball, causing it to hop, and also but with small actuators you can tip the way the leg is. It's weighted so it will land onto the same spot on the ball and then it will, in fact, um, uh, hop and then roll and bounce and cover substantial diff distances. Um, okay, so um, all polymer bistable uh, actuated muscles. You didn't, most people don't know that you can make plastic motors. Uh, most think, people think you need wires, magnets, and stuff to make uh, motors, but you don't anymore. Um, and you can use high efficiency fuel cells. So we'll talk a little bit about it. So that's the fuel tanks, which I already mentioned. The bistable EPAMs, which are the plastic actuators, and the power waves. Um, so, you know, the robot, by means of the small actuators inside, can, can charge its leg and then um, uh, orient itself to the direction it wants to go and then hop off. Um, and they can bounce, and this is, you know, remember this is not, will probably not fly, certainly won't fly for 10 years, so um, a lot of this is um, a lot less fantasy than the previous speaker spoke of, but uh, still has that attribute of being a little bit of uh, um, still futuristic. So here's the balls dropping into the caves, and the notion that they would could hop their way up, up the hill. They can hop uphill. Um, what's interesting is to give us nice nice things is that uh, when when the roof does collapse it typically leaves a pyramid shape at the bottom of the cave and then we believe we're speculating now but everybody knows on Mars there are very very high winds and there are dust devils we've seen how many people have seen the videos of the dust devils on there well it's likely that dust will yeah raise your hand yeah in the elbow, yeah, right. Um, the dust will settle in there, forming a nice dusty kind of sandy pyramid that the balls will be able to effectively land on, then travel down these caves, these tubes, which are well defined. Okay, sensors. Um, we would have heterogeneous, heterogeneous sensor suites, meaning all the balls would have different, or all the robots would have different sensors, they could function together to achieve it. Um, various things. You could have panoramic imaging, and you could have antennas, and lots of microelectronics in it, and um, the communications would be done by means of these local area networks.